<laughs> yeah, this is, you know, just brilliant minds. It's a dance. It is a dance. So as you both know, Gary and Randy both, since we've last talked, I mean, it's almost like daily. There's more information coming to the floor here. We've all got our heads on a swivel. It's hard to kind of take in everything daily because everything is amping and there's a quickening happening that those of us with eyes to see, let me put it that way, are really in observance of. And so let's start this off with the alien agenda. And since you wrote this book, Gary, a lot has changed. And here we are in a month of, and we know that this is just for the masses. We understand that there's been an agenda all along. What's happening now is the revealing. This has all been in the works. And so now the curtain's coming back and more and more people are able to see what's going on. And where I wanted to get with this was parsing out what are aliens? What is the alien agenda? And how does this fit into what's going on right now, especially when the governments of the world are talking transparency for once. Now, of course, I don't subscribe to anything that's being told to me outright from these government powers. They seem to always lie to us. But everyone's talking aliens, so let's talk aliens. Let me start with you, Gary. What has changed since you wrote the book and Chapter 48? The way I look at things in terms of how my book was written is I don't view things that have changed. I think things continue to develop in a direction that was already underway. And it's just adding more flesh onto the bones. So directionally, I think everything is going in the direction that I wrote in the book. And I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I'm just saying these things just sort of, if you, if you take a step back, they have to kind of come about. And one of the things I talk about in the book is this sort of great coming out that they have to have the governments and the secret societies and everybody that's currently working with these presences. And we'll leave it at that just for the time being. So that there is kind of a transition period. And I think that's what's about to happen. So I don't expect that in this great report that's going to come out from the U.S. government that we're going to get the whole truth because we're not. And we're not even going to get a significant piece of it, but it is the first step to preparing people. Even though people have been prepared for generations and particularly in this last generation for what's going to be coming about, this is just going to be the start of it, but they're not going to welcome us to this sort of galactic table of alien nations that's in this brand alliance against <laughs> the evil force of the universe yet. They're just going to come out and probably say something really, really stupid. And it's like, yes. it's, we don't know what it is, is what they're going to say. We think it could be Russian. We think it could be Chinese. And they're just going to, I guess, in a provocative way and directly motivate people to demand more information in terms of what they're going to do, because you can't make a plausible argument that China or Russia had any of these things that say in 1947 or 1948 or before that. So it's going to be a nonsense argument, but it's a start and it's an important threshold event that is going to start preparing people and the world uh, for the end time and the things that need to come about. And this is sort of that start. So I'll leave it there for now. Excellent. Randy, what do you have on this initial getting our toe in the water? Well, Gary pointed out they've been conditioning us. They've done it over a period of, mm, depending on how far back you want to go, using the entertainment media Certainly since the 1970s, uh, the modern era of films coming from Spielberg and George Lucas specifically, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, E.T., and just dozens and dozens of films since, have prepared a backdrop of expectation, whether it's good E.T., bad E.T., it doesn't really matter. The um, counterculture of this that being the UFO disclosure movement of which I've been a part of, has also kind of been intercepted by intelligence assets for almost as long as it's been around. And certainly since about 2017, what we saw in the UFO movement was a steady drip 
of increasingly distorted information that was branching out of the pure research that was done by numerous independent UFO research groups over the years. I'm not going to give any of them recognition because they're all corrupted now. What we began to see and where this all went was the Tom DeLong group to the STARS Academy and the two key players there, Louis Alessandro and Christopher Mellon, Christopher Mellon being of the East Coast Establishment Mellon Banking family, whose aunt was also part of the counterculture movement that gave us Timothy Leary and the LSD movement. And um, Chris Mellon have split from TTSA. DeLong sort of left holding an empty bag at this point because he wanted to make films. And Elizondo has moved forward. He's being interviewed uh, quite hope high profile on places like Fox News, MSNBC, and CNN. And Christopher Mellon a little less so. But Mellon is sort of the backstage orchestrator right now. While they are leaking data from the military discussing what they're calling UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena, and releasing, frankly, quite dated video that the Navy had taken of various encounters. None of this, none of this is really new information to people like us, but to the public, the acknowledgement of it in mainstream media is the imprimatur that something else is moving at this point. And That really is the goal, is to now plant this into the mainstream media, because if you've watched how they've managed COVID, um, whatever is broadcast, looped, and AI programmed into the mainstream media becomes the dominant mindset of the American public, the world public, actually. So that's kind of a a capsule view from my standpoint of where we're at right now. This is, this is the preparation. This is, as Gary said, it's kind of an interim period. It's a, it's a uh, kind of the vestibule into the unknown. To me, it's like the incense is going now. There's smoke and we're in the smoke and we can't see clearly, but something has obviously been signaled that there's a change of foot. And one of the questions I had for both of you here, the timing here is phenomenal. How is it that everything lined up at this time? And that is what I want to springboard and ask both of you. It's uncanny. So, Gary, if you want to go ahead with that. Yeah, again, I think it's it's that sort of natural progression. And the thing that I look towards, if you're going to have this sort of introduction of we're not alone in the, in the universe to set up world government and the world religion and everything else that's that's going to follow, is that you have to have a population that's ready for the message and you have to have a population that is moving up the ladder, so to speak, on the technology. And so these so-called aliens, and sometimes they're called watchers and they're called a thousand different things by whichever group um, somebody might be subscribing to or following or researching – it's not like they haven't been here all along. They have. And so this is that introduction point. And this is not the last seven years. Um, I think we might be closing in on the last seven years, but we're not there yet. But this is still in the birth pang section. And it's part of that last generation. And if you're going to start to have a fulfillment of prophetic sets of events, this is required. And it starts to set up the other things that will start to make sense, along with the catastrophes that are going to happen that will uh, make things previously thought not possible be able to happen that will now be possible to happen. But this, I think, is that sort of threshold turning point where things have come together in enough areas from a pandemic, which is a birth pain. It's not part of the, you know, the 33% destruction or 25% destruction or a bold judgment of 100%, except for uh, the stepping in of Jesus. What you have is birth pangs and they're getting stronger as we go and to get to the next level as these birth pangs are starting to be introduced, then this makes perfect sense to have this timing because people are going to need more of a reason 
to come together as one religion and one world government. And that alien phenomena is one of the things that they prepared the audience for worldwide that in almost all of the entertainment is that as soon as we find out we're not alone in the universe, we form this sort of Babylon, Babylon 5 ready government to join the rest of the galactic species. And it's just kind of one of those things that it just has to happen. And the timing has to be relatively synchromeshed because if the audience is not ready for the message or the technology isn't in place for a whole bunch of different things that they need to do or a sudden further advancement of the knowledge and a logical explanation for that, a.k.a. coming from these alleged aliens, then people aren't going to buy it and they're going to start sniffing through the propaganda. So that's why I think these things have to come together. And that's why I preface my first comments that this is that threshold event, which really start to amp things up as disappointing as the little information that they're going to provide and the credibility of that argument. But it's designed to feed the fever of people's expectations as they've been prepared to be global citizens. And this is, this is why it's so important on the timing. This whole global thing that's tying into this, this timing is in lockstep, as we all know. Uh, Randy, with this going in from where Gary has laid off here, what are your thoughts there? And also, I think it's a good idea if we back up a little bit and give our separate ideas of what we think, in quotes here, aliens are. It seems to be one of those very gray areas where there's a lot of infighting within the UFO community and outside of the UFO community as to what aliens are. Now, biblically minded people are having an eye towards the angelic order and how they play into our experience here and the process in which we move through life. And, I think everyone has had, whether it's in a dream or in real life, even in the wee hours, mystical experiences. And what I say by this, what I mean by saying mystical is stuff that doesn't really fit into your day side narrative, into your day side mind of uh, the world that you are perceiving. And I'm saying you as the masses of getting up, going to work, paying the bills and that whole thing. Really, that to me is the idea of the Catherine wheel. It's a, it's a slow torture and it's a, a long haul of consciousness that makes everyone so thin and wispy by the end of the day when our ancestors would find this time to reflect on what's going on and read the signs around them. So by pulling back and looking at what are our ideas of aliens. Now, Gary, you mentioned um, aliens could be interchanged for the watchers. And that's a good uh, stepping point here as we talk about divine timing. Randy, what do you have to say or input on these ideas of the others? First off, I dislike the term aliens. It's imprecise, yes, and it's provided a lot of cover for a lot of entities who have been operating in this reality construct. And that's all very deliberate. Um, in terms of we need to define better all these conflated terminologies of ETs, extraterrestrial beings, interdimensional beings, and all of that obviously being suffused under the heading of aliens. So there are many layers and many levels to this, some of which are legitimately what you would call off-world beings who have come into the earth, some benevolent, some malevolent, many malevolent. There are beings which you would call non-alien residents, let's use that term since it's a legal term, non-alien residents who are not technically anthropomorphically human and probably of a um, origin somewhere other than Earth, but they've been here for a very long time. So 
in all of that, we have a whole spectrum of different beings, some of which legitimately you would, again, kind of suffuse under the terminology of the fallen angels, the archons, the shining ones, the serpents, and then within the extraterrestrial realm, there are just dozens of them. Uh, you know, I mean, the Anunnaki come into play heavily here because they figure into uh, actually the, even the Genesis context, uh, certainly Genesis 6 as well. It's very difficult to break down. I've actually been doing some of this as I've been going through my receiver series on, um, on Off Planet Radio of trying to a little more clearly understand that these beings, some of which we would not recognize as entities in the way that they are formed, we think anthropomorphically. We think that way about the being that we call God as well. We form an anthropomorphic image of beings who themselves may not actually be what we view as entities themselves. And within that's a whole scale of things. So the only thing that we can do at this point is stay as close to the source material, which Gary does a great job of outlining in his book. He references uh, many of the great old texts and translations that make some of this more understandable and try to delineate what exactly encompasses what I consider to be the great threat in this present period. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Oh, absolutely. That brings us closer in. And that's why we... I'd like to build on that, too. Please, please go, Gary. Yes. Go ahead, please. So when we talk, talk about the angelic realm, that is exactly as what was laid out. So uh, we have to understand that that is a separate set of beings from the other group that was being talked about. So let me just sort of flesh that out a little little bit. What we do know is, is there's a hierarchy of the angels and there is a hierarchy of these host of angels in the fallen realm as well. So you've got angels at their classification, but they're not at the top of the angelic sort of hierarchy. So, you know, to hear terms like uh, the archons and the serpents and serpents also has some lower classifications that it's not amongst the angelic realm as well that we need to pay some attention to, but like the seraphim angels are the fiery serpent ones and they were in charge of government and religion. And they're the ones that work before the altar in, uh, in heaven. And some of those re- rebelled and they're likely the watchers of Genesis six. And we get watchers in Daniel four, three times, and they're coming down from heaven dealing with government and that's one kind of the angelic beings and you've got uh, mighties and you've got um, these powerful um, uh, the Greek word is dunamis and a few other ones that uh, and there's just sort of this you know there's other ones that are included like you know the thrones and the virtues and it's all part of this hierarchy. So they're going to come at us in all sorts of different forms. And even with the watchers, you've got, according to Enoch, you have Ophanim, which is the uh, word for wheel in Hebrew. And that's part of the ones who have these wheels of the throne of God that are part of the throne that are shown in Ezekiel. That's yeah, the word exactly. Ophan yeah. and I am is the male plural. Right. And you have the cherubim and that's all part of the watchers. So you have different kinds of watchers as well. And as you move through this sort of hierarchy of angels, we also need to understand they have this sort of changeling quality that they have the ability to do in the physical world. And they can, seemingly take any form that they want, even though they may have a specific form they like to be presenting themselves in. But then after that, after all of those different looks that you could get, you would have the offspring of the fallen angels and what I would call the greater Nephilim concept. So that not only do you have the Nephilim, which some of them would have had a a serpent kind of look, but you also have 
other Nephilim type of creatures that are of different formats and the elementals are, would be a classification of that. And that includes in the fourth classification, the salamanders, which are another reptilian being. And then you have within the three classifications, you have the ugly ones. And within that, you have the gnomes who have this identical look to the gray aliens and do the same things and have the same kind of technology and come through portals. And Mm -hmm. so you're going to have this, this whole array of beings from all of these different classifications of beings that were probably some created by the, the fallen angels. And who knows what happened in super prehistory that may or may not have taken place. And these are also said to be in the earth and above the earth. And so I think there's more of an interdimensional exactly. travel aspect as opposed yeah. to planetary, but I'm open to planetary, but I think it's more interdimensional where they're coming from because all of these things come together in that sort of understanding of portal and with all the technology heading towards multiple dimensions so that you, we can get access in our preparation. So I've been on a bit of a long rap, rant, but I just wanted to open people up that there's going to be so many of these different looks and a hierarchy to it from you know, size and capability right up to the most powerful ones. Let's get into interdimensionality. And Randy, if you have anything to add with what was just our transition into interdimensionality, please, please come in with that and then bring us into the idea of interdimensionality. I don't have a lot to add or amplify on that because I think Gary broke down um, sort of the arcana that we're dealing with pretty well with that. Um <clears throat> In terms of interdimensionality, this gets tricky because most people don't think outside of three-dimensional time space. Now, three-dimensional time space would, of course, be four-dimensional. And even ordering levels of dimensionality in itself is, is a linear concept that does not serve us. So we really come to a place where we start to understand that The earth itself, both naturally and the way it has been re-engineered, enables different vantage points of interdimensional travel portals. Some are natural, many are artificial. This goes into um, what goes on with underground bases. It goes into what goes on um, with mountains, specifically certain key mountain ranges um, mountain tops as being access portals which enable moving interdimensionally. The interdimensional beings themselves have the ability to, I will not say shape shift so much as solidify forms to operate <clears throat> in stealth mode. Um, these beings may appear as beings of light. They may may appear as um, translucent beings, beings that sort of are in a liminal state between actual corporeal physicality and something a little bit more um, less solid. So somewhere between that. But the concept that beings move in and out of, of dimensional space is something that this may be the part first off that most people will struggle with because we're thinking, and this is the problem with the UFO research that's occurred. It's all been nuts and bolts, hardware, UFOs, crash retrievals, photographs, videos. All of that keeps us locked in the mindset of things that conform to our three-dimensional solidified worldview. And the worldview of anybody who's going to deal with successfully with these beings or with anything that has to do with the spiritual realm means you have to remove the limitations of three-dimensional, four-dimensional time space in order to conceive of it, much less to delve closer into it. And so when we're looking at ideas of portals as a way to move through dimensions, to move through interdimensional space, and a lot of ideas around portals are circumambulating 
just the word itself. We've got black holes. We've got dream space. We have uh, all these different states of consciousness, theta, beta, etc. We have physical stuff now in the plane, in the field, in the realm, such as the hydron colliders and other tech. It, we could also bring in Tesla and Steinman's and their work with the etheric field. And this opens it up wide that if we are coming at this realm in which we are and where we're trying to interpret all of the information with five senses, limited to five senses, then Everything outside of those five senses becomes very mysterious and unknown and unreachable if we're allowing only our five senses to inform us on the greater mm -hmm. aspect. And so, so yes, carry on. There, just to bring this into something that we can ground as a context, I realize that you have a very diverse listening audience. I suspect that they listen to you to get a diverse view, but to ground this a little bit into something that we can manage. I always come back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, which gives you basically a very good hierarchy and then prescribes basically a means to reckon it and deal with these powers. And it tells you, uh, I'm just going to read it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. And there's a hierarchy there. There's an order. And it's telling you these are not all of this world because the high places are something that we would consider to be extra dimensional. And so for people who are of the Christian faith, you know, this, this, these verses were put here to prepare you for this. That's not what your churches are telling you. But that's what I've been telling people on radio going back to 2003. I've basically been saying you need to stay very close to this because there is a great deception coming. And the only thing you're going to be able to reckon with is if you have the ability to use spiritual eyes to see. Yes, thank you. That is so powerful. Gary, what do you have to amplify this particular thought and especially that phrase? I do. And I think it sort of goes back to what you were talking about in terms of the timing of what's going on. And one of the pieces of that timing is that the churches have not prepared us. They have not been teaching us for what is going to take place. And again, I think that is something that Christians have to be aware of that they've been infiltrated and they don't teach prehistory and they don't teach prophecy. And there's a reason for that. They want people spiritually blind going into this wave of propaganda, signs, miracles, catastrophes, technology in an ever increasing sort of tenacious wave coming one after another so that people aren't grounded in, let me take a step back. What is really going on here? Is this spiritual? Is this physical? Is it both? And these verses are not being taught. They are just not being taught, let alone prophecy, let alone that to understand prophecy, you need to understand prehistory because everything flows out of that. So it's designed to, to sort of serve people up for what's going on on this. And we have to get through the understanding that when we're talking about these invisible ones, whether or not they're in a spiritual or an opalescent sort of format or in some other sort of format, that these are uh, part of the higher end of the hierarchy, but they've got incredible other layers throughout the hierarchy with the elementals being at, at the bottom. And that, they're, they've had descendants on earth working for them and trying to enslave humankind ever since the beginning. And those forces are all actively working together today to bring this end time about where they're going to have this introduction of all of these different kinds of aliens, whether or not they're, you know, it doesn't matter what you want to call them in terms of watchers or, you know, the different kinds of them. There, there's going to be many because they have to sell 
as what was said earlier, this great delusion that's going to be coming, that even the elect will be deceived if that were possible. And Jesus tells us that it is possible and that, there, that people will be deceived. So we're not going to be able to count on our church leaders because they're not preparing us. And they've been infiltrated right from the seminary schools to not teach the things that people need. So to be able to understand what's going on, you have to be able to think interdimensionally. And with all of the technology that's coming, you're going to have to think interdimensionally. And you're going to have to be able to rely on what's in Scripture because that's going to be your only, from a Christian perspective, your only guideline because there's going to be only two choices that are offered, this way or that way. And everybody's going to be forced into making choices. And those choices are going to be very difficult. Are you going to participate in everything that's going on? Are you going to look at it critically and say, does this really make some sense and what is really going on here? And all of those, just as we've seen with these birth bang sort of being ramped up with the media, uh, carrying the message, and that every other point of view, scientific fact or otherwise, is shut down, is the way that they're going to drive this thing forward. And it's going to be very difficult to break through. So we're going to have to be able to communicate in smaller groups to be able, and in great numbers in smaller groups, to be able to help people sort through what's going on. So this is something that we have to understand, and it begins with these passages in the Bible, as in, you know, we're fighting both the invisible and the and the visible forces. We're fighting the spiritual and the physical. And we have to understand that they have the representatives on earth who are the physical ones who are carrying out the things on the ground for the other beings and particularly led through the hierarchy of the fallen angelic realm. The other thing that occurs to me here, and this backs up a little bit niche to what you prefaced earlier in terms of the preparation period of where we may be in time. I'm not looking so much at mm, the hardwired seven year or variously, you know, there are many, there are many teachings out there that teach a three and a half year tribulation or seven year it's variable but so much is what has occurred since i began i walked away largely from prophecy for a number of years and stayed pretty much on the research-based side of things when i came back into this in 2019 it was with a knowing that we were entering a window of time as i called it so the opening of the doors in 2020 was the beginning of something it's the vestibule it's it's the opening it's the opening fanfare to the great play and what covid did the entire psyop which was multifarious multi-level and operated for any number of um agendas was it prepared people to accept a state of fear-induced, hypnotic um, disconnect from anything inside of themselves. Uh, the fear that was amplified via media through the hypnotic states that were installed are there now. And that means you have a very malleable public mind, which is now more accepting of any messages that are putting out. So we're not surprised to find that in the throes of um, us dealing with the so-called pandemic, the throes of this great outreach to uh, synthetically inoculate, to, to present a therapy that they're calling a vaccine, which has what I consider to be the makings of, of something quite horrendous to, to humanity in terms of the messenger RNA that's in it. Um, we now have the preparations at hand for what you would call um, the prince of the power of the air, the antichrist, however you want to phrase that. In other words, the stage has already been set. This is what has been really revealing as an observer looking at the public 
And when I say the public, what I'm saying is the global, or the not necessarily global, but wherever people stand on that, the world stage. And uh, everyone got to see what choices people are going to make when it comes to comforts, when it comes to ease of life with promises of returning to whatever normalcy was. These choices, as I had said way before all this, that difficult choices are coming to everyone's door, have been at everyone's door, and they're going to continue to knock at our doors from here on out. Heavy, difficult choices. And what we're seeing on the world stage is definitely a coming together of entities or beings or of consciousness in a way that is very constricting and it's playing into so synchronistically, synchromistically into all this stuff that I'm seeing in the canon. And then as I was seeing in the canon, having not come from the canon, I am able to pull in all this other information from all these other places that I have been familiar with and say, this is all the same thing. This period of time, this alignment that is happening is, to me, completely constructed and where we are now as a pinpoint of consciousness is we're watching everyone make these choices and sign these contracts without even being aware of it. In some cases, I'm going to do this because I want to go hug my great aunt, or I'm going to do this because I want to get on a plane and have my vacation in Mexico, honey. You know, it's, it's all this stuff that is now becoming very obvious if we're looking through spiritual eyes what do you see here going on with all of these dare i say trials gary and we're seeing with these choices of making these heavy choices that involve tying us into a digital other some sort of system that is unfolding yeah we're still in the test stages so we're in the trial balloons right they're testing things and they're seeing how the world reacts what's successful what's not successful and so they're going to develop on that on the next set of either cataclysmic events uh, pandemic type of events or whatever the event is going to be including uh, you know an announcement that we're not alone in the universe they're going to draw on that and improve on it and increase it as they go and perfect it. Just as the vaccine, it isn't the mark of the beast that a lot of people think it is, but it is entering a, so to speak, a portal into a new level of technology and access at the lower, you know, the smallest levels of what makes us up that they'll be able to do things through messaging down the road. So this isn't the one we have to be concerned with yet, I don't think. But what's coming is going to have the ability to change your DNA, to change you at the subatomic level, at the, you know, and insert bots and nanobots and all those different things that they can recreate at the smallest parts of of creation with that is a viola violation against the laws of creation that were really kind of worn. So these are testing not to scare people off, but to see how do we brainwash them and prepare them and condition them to accept what we're offering, that great delusion that's reserved for a specific generation. And I think that's the generation that we're in. So all of these things are playing out. And when the next one comes along, they're going to wrap it up because they've learned a lot. So a lot of things worked well for them. A lot of things didn't work well. And so they're going to adapt because they are relentless and it is contrived. They want to bring this about, but you're dealing with a lot of people that you're trying to deceive. So it's going to take some test runs and that's what they're doing through what I would call the birth pangs as these things get stronger. And I think they've had a lot of success. They've had 
I think, too much success in getting people to obey uh, in trade for you can do this or you can do that. And I think they're going to play on that harder so that when you finally get down to that mark of the beast, which is more than just um, the uh, the medical and you know insertion into your body into your body um, to help health and give longer life but it is this nexus point of all of these technologies that they're going to be bringing on to people so it's going to have ai involved it's going to have interdimensional access to knowledge and things like that it's going to be this greater system that's going to be that mark of the beast but at some point before there there's going to be these vaccines that are going to be able to do things that they that we should not permit them to do at that sort of subatomic level and i think they're trying to figure out how do we continue to give them a bit of a carrot and a stick and what's the right measures to get them to be more pliable to what we want them to do as as they continually ramp up the model for world government but again it's going to take significant catastrophes and revelations and development of the birth pangs to get them there Uh, because i don't think they can sew this thing together until they get the universal religion more in place and that's going to take the false prophets and we are definitely going to be diving into the false prophets in the the next segment. But Randy, do you have anything to add to that? I don't think I so much diverge as I would say that at this present stage, any compliance with any administration of a so-called government-sponsored vaccine program, which is what we have, is a dangerous step. Uh, from a spiritual standpoint, you've already accepted the preconditions for something that's coming. Yes. Because the entree into this is going to be the acceptance, and the acceptance is um, by stages, but you have already taken the first step, and we know that what they are doing, what even Moderna said on its own website, was that we are installing an operating system into your body. That operating system will require more updates. And of course, if you uh, decide to opt in at a later period of time, they'll be happy to install it, probably much like Windows does now. It does a wrap-up update where it takes all of its previous updates, wraps it up into one package, and, and blows it into your system so that you're currently updated. These computer models were designed to condition us as well to this concept of of never-ending updates. I mean, at one time, you installed a program, and then, you know, they would issue updates, and you would decide if you were going to download it or update it or not. And I know that because I did system administration on, um, on Windows NT systems. Now, you don't have a choice. And so, the metaphor is not lost on any of us, even the concept of the computer virus itself, which is a complete... Yes. Uh, misapplication of the term virus. They're not viruses, they were codes. But then again, so is COVID. It's not a virus, it's a code. And it's a virus that was communicated subliminally, digitally, through the complex of media which broadcast it. And that is how they will begin to work. They will work as much as they can possibly on the subliminal level, and the more conditioned people are, the more likely they are to accept the subliminal conditioning that's coming. It is not lost on me that the digital system around us that needed us to create it. So somehow it came in through insights of genius and magical means of epiphanies to all of a sudden bring us step by step to where we are now. And, you know, we often call these people that move us forward, if you will, geniuses. And so here we are. It took human hands to get us to where we are. But now we have an up and running, fully integrated system across the plane, across the realm. And as we've moved deeper into this reality, what we're seeing now is this great unfolding of how 
everyone on the global stage is interrelating, right? So we're seeing the move of globalism happen. Everyone has come together, the, and the big, the big muckety mucks, right, have come together to say, this is a pandemic. This is uh, the trouble. This is the cure. Follow us. And we've seen that with governments working together. Governments that throw out on the little stages, America doesn't like Russia, America doesn't like China, America likes, uh, you know, this one and that one. We see all these little dramas. And yet, and yet, in the midst of all that, they manage to coordinate a response to a worldwide global pandemic. Yes. In less than 90 days. Yes. I mean, oh, these people I, I, that I, don't I, allegedly get along. Unconditionally, completely <laughs> uniform. In responses, some nations were more um, <clears throat> militant about it. Here in the United States, you've got this inconvenience called the Constitution and states' rights, which <laughs> so messed with the concept. The entire world responded pretty much in <clears throat> Rockefellerese in lockstep yes. on something we would never agree to. We haven't agreed to much of anything as nations, but we agreed to this 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 pandemic. Yes. Well, and then it's inter inter interesting that you insert Rockefeller and there's a Rockefeller group, and you're probably aware of it in 2011 that sort of laid out how they would, they ought to react to the pandemic that's going mm -hmm. to come. And everything that followed was same step by step by step process that they had laid out in 2011. So, when, and when you look at the coronavirus, and I know they're still allegedly trying to get to the bottom of the changing of that virus, and it's a contrived man-made virus. All of this is contrived. All of this is designed to move Absolutely. us towards yes. a point in time. And I think all of the pandemics coming and catastrophes and everything is part of a larger plan. They may not be able to nail things down to an exact day or a year or anything because they, they, there's obstacles, but they are driving that agenda forward all of the time. And this was with the COVA, COVA COVID response around the world was a significant step forward in terms of testing where they're at and they will, they will improve on it and it will become less tolerant as they go. So we will, we will be experiencing persecution and genocide on the next go arounds, maybe yes. not the next one, but it is going to be coming and they've already been able to, how, how, what's the best way of, of saying that you're isolating people and denying them as being human? They're almost yes. subhuman, right? They're, they're, they're already preparing people for that. Well, they don't deserve to have their freedom. They don't deserve to be able to do things. They don't deserve to be out in the world. They should be in concentration camps. They don't deserve to lie. To, 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 to live. So they're going to continue to up that as we go, or you're going to get two mass genocides because they don't want to hear the other point of view. They're not interested in it. They're interested in the outcome of their agenda and it's all pre-planned. They're going to struggle to get there as fast as they want, which is why they're always frustrated, but they're still moving forward. And that's the thing that people have to keep in mind. This is absolutely prescient this thought this idea this momentum that's happening and to pull a thread here that will kind of wrap this first session up and introduce us into the next session is this idea of we look at how all of a sudden globally entities and I mean that as corporate entities, as digital entities, really, uh, have come together that on the lower stage look like they're warring and at odds and all this, have come together. And it begs the question to me, looking at it with my mystical eye, with my spiritual eye, that there has been some sort of, in quotes, invasion through top layers down and as we were talking about interdimensionality and the ability of our limited perceptions of the realm 
because of our five senses, right, and that everyone gets so grounded into, that there's no connection there. But I think that all along, this was going to self-generate, and we see this with the canon, and we see this with other magical stories of origin from other cultures. Obviously, we're in this period, but what's becoming more blatantly clear is that those that are running this agenda are doing it in unison. They're doing it together, and it's very clear that the world population is separate and askew from that intentionally, of course. We're chattel, uh, basically, to these entities. And here's where I want to pull this in. Are these entities, through portals and through the lattice of digital reality we are in now, with augmented reality, virtual reality, and all this, is this part of the alien reveal? There are humans out there that are not humans. If you want loosely, we can call them possessed by. They're vehicles. Our bodies are vehicles. And so to me, I guess here's the question, and I'm prefacing it with this. To me, it looks like this is all from one group, one one consciousness that is seeking this control for whatever reason that brings us to here and now, and it's non-human. So with that, I give the floor to both of you, Gary and and Randy, on that. Sure. I mean, there's there's a lot there in what you were talking about. And you ended on that it is one specific sort of group. And I think that's essentially true, as that sort of breaks down as you get into the field of implementing their tactics and their troops that are on the ground. You're going to have rivals, and it's going to be a little bit confusing, but that's why you have to watch sort of the directional aspect in terms of how they're heading there. But there's always going to be rivals because Earth is going to be this place of of a promise that's going to be told to us that we're going to be able to live in a realm on our own away from the evil force of the of, of the universe. And essentially that's how they're going to play it. And we're going to have to stand in there and fight for that. And that there are other presence and beings that are out there. And so within who is sort of going to be targeted and reserved to be the people living in that new age, in that new Atlantis, then there is going to be rival factions. Remember, when you get down to the ultimate point of Antichrist, there can only be one family, right? So it's, it's, there's these rivalries that are going on around the world, but they're all part of the same group of the ruling elite that come from the same history that are all working towards one direction. There just can only be one true family, but there's always going to be this going forward, this elite sort of extended family of relatives and like kinds of beings. And as you mentioned, the body is a vessel. Um, the body and the soul is the dwelling place for the spirit. It's the Oikatarian, it's the habitation, as it's described, that the angels left heaven on. And so for them to take a physical form or for a demon spirit to want to interact in the world, it has to do a possession. But that's typically difficult for them to work with because although they can interact in the world, they are typically suppressing the host and usually the host doesn't want to be suppressed. Now, when you get into the sort of the shaman and occult act aspect of it, they are bringing on these spirits. And so there might be some sort of in the occult that I'm not an expert on this, some sort of symbiotic relationship between um, a shaman uh, or a magician or a priest or whatever title you want to provide that person who's, been educated in in the uh, highest levels of occultism and the, the highest degrees that they can have that sort of effect. It would be similar to the avatar effect with the avatar. But typically, we don't see a lot of that with the demons. It's usually this sort of violent suppression, whereas an avatar is a symbiotic kind of relationship where the host is actually improved with it. So when Vishnu, for example, would have incarnated Buddha, 
brought bringing Buddha all of this wisdom in in every incarnation that Vishnu or Shiva would have done, they would have added that. Just as Satan, when he entered into Judas, permitted Judas to have that extra strength to to to, uh, to uh, betray Jesus. Just so I bring it back to sort of a biblical reference that I'm just not talking mysticism here. Um, so we have to keep that in mind that. There, there, there could be that going on with that sort of avatar effect or perhaps that what the shamans can be doing. Um, but I would also look for the technology to provide clone bodies or some bodies of some form where it's going to be that dwelling place for the spirit, for the demon spirits to participate in the end time. So I'm not quite sure we're there yet, but we've got these other things that are going on that we need to, we need to be aware of. And we also need to understand that the descendants of the Raphaim and the Nephilim, and that gets into sort of into the uh, a rabbit trail that we probably don't have time for is whether or not Nephilim survived the flood or there's a second incursion. But the point is, is that they take their genealogies back to these, these fallen angels through these giants, these hybrid angelic uh, humans that were created. And these are the ones that are working for the, the rebellious angels today to bring all of this about. So we have to consider all of that into the mix. We're looking at a shift in consciousness that demands we reconcile our reality with something that sits outside of our present construct, that being what you call the the alien presence. One of the great prophetic books in the Bible was the book of Daniel. In the 11th chapter of Daniel, Daniel begins to talk about prophetically what we would consider to be the template of what we might call the Antichrist which is, there's numerous descriptions, but one of them is it says loosely, in his estate he shall honor the God of forces, a God that his fathers did not know. In other words, the alien God. And so that right there just seems to frame it in terms of we're not in Kansas anymore and things are about to get deeply strange. Well, that's that's perfect. And uh, with the Deeply Strange, we shall be moving forward into the next session. And where I want to go with that is talking about the realities that are being created around us, which are, of course, thin, as far as actors in a play. And so with that, Gary, how may people find you in the world? Well, the best way is to contact me through my website, the Genesis6conspiracy.com, Genesis6 with the number 6conspiracy.com. And on there, there's a contact the author. So if you're looking to ask for a document or you have a question that you'd like to ask or make a comment on something, that's the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, you can also buy a book off my website or connect over to Amazon and or to Barnes and Noble or to the Kindle version to get the book. Or you can get a hold of me on Facebook through um, Gary Wayne and or on Messenger. So the best place to get a hold of me is uh, through my website. Thank you. And Randy, how may people find you? <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult. Um, right now, I don't have a functional, really, web setup. Um, Radio.offplanetmedia.net is really the, the, the page right now. I'm on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins, and YouTube is uh, Off Planet Media, so you can just go into YouTube forward slash, youtube.com forward slash Off Planet Media, and pretty much everything we've done for almost a decade, is there. Excellent. Thank you for this first intriguing session as we will move into the back session now. Thank you, everyone, for this joining is us Planet here. Radio.